you are writing across the pages of space and time. Grant us grace to learn from those who have gone before us, that we may build on their successes and avoid their failures, knowing that those who will not learn from history are doomed to make the same mistakes. All this we ask in the name of the one who entered history for our salvation, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for our canticle. Let us read responsibly a portion of Acts chapter 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. God does not live in temples built by hands. And God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, God himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. God marked out the point of times in history the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though God is not far from any one of us. For in God we live and move and have our being. As the poets have said, we are God's offspring. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Scripture. A reading about history and remembrance from Deuteronomy. But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you a land with fine, large cities that you did not build, houses filled with all sorts of goods that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant, and when you have eaten your fill, take care that you did not forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Thus, when your children ask you in time to come, what is the meaning of the decrees and the statutes and the ordinances that, that the Lord our God has commanded you. Then you shall, shall say to your children, we were the Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Then the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for lasting good, so as to keep us alive, as is now the case. If we diligently observe this entire commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded to us, we will be in the right. For it was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Hear God's message to his people. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Eternal, Eternal God, God, you made the universe with all of its marvelous order, its atoms, worlds, and galaxies, and the infinite complexity of living creatures. Grant that as we probe the mysteries of your creation, we may come to know you more truly and more surely fulfill our role in your eternal purpose. Through the guidance of Jesus Christ. Amen. Giver of grace. We thank you for the people who care for us, the experiences that bring us joy, and the glimpse of your glory we see in the world around us. Amen. Fill us with your grace. Prince of Peace, bring an end to warfare and violence in the world. Bring justice to the oppressed and use us as peacemakers in situations of anger, fear, and injustice. Amen. Fill us with your peace. Lord of love, make us ever mindful of the needs of others. 
Make us ever responsive to the cry of the hungry. Make us ever ready to share our bounty with those around us. Amen. Fill us with your love. Fount of wisdom, in all our questions and doubts, guide us in your way, lead us into all truth, and show us how to live abundant life. Amen. Fill us with your wisdom. Source, source of strength, help us in our trials and tribulations. Sustain us when we are weary and fearful, and raise us up when we struggle and fall. Amen. Fill us with your strength. Now, following the words that our teacher Jesus has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. May God grant you grace to learn from history, to build on what was successful in the past, and to avoid failures. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. And join me in offering a blessing upon today's senior chapel talk by Gregory Michael R. Curry. <laughs> Greg. Greg. May wisdom guide your message and give you words to speak. May truth flow from your mouth and your heart be filled with peace. Let us celebrate God's gifts in the life of Greg. Morning, TMI. The year is 1775. The British Empire, under King George III, controls a collection of 13 colonies along the eastern North American seaboard. The rugged inhabitants of these colonies are undoubtedly English, connected to their distant homeland by a shared language, set of customs, and allegiance to a singly, divinely appointed monarch. But despite the strong social bonds between British colonists and the British crown, deep tensions and discontent are uncommonly high. The empire, struggling to pay off its massive war debt, places much of the burden on its colonial subjects. Worse than this, unlike English subjects on the mainland, the colonists are not given representation in parliament, meaning taxes are being levied on them without their consent. In response to such an egregious injustice, political groups in the colonies organize protests, commit acts of vandalism, and encourage civil disobedience among the population. Mid-spring, 1775, British troops moved to seize a colonial arms cache in Concord, Massachusetts. American militiamen halt their advance, leading to the first battle in the American War of Independence a war which would lead to the formation of the United States and the affirmation of the unalienable rights we cherish today. A war which would alter world history and which made the blessed life you are now living possible. Now, I'm confident that most of my peers in the TMI class of 2018 who have had the misfortune of sharing a class with me at some point in their high school careers aren't at all surprised at how my ta talk has started out. In fact, I'm sure that anyone who has only just shared a short conversation with me was expecting something like this. Well, for those of you who just know me as a skinny kid with bad posture that likes to talk about memes while doing a half-decent impression of the head of the TMI Foreign Language Department, Senior Archer, Let me fill you in on the story. I love history. I always have, and I always will. I love history to the point where I feel the need in any social situation to reference obscure historical facts and figures that remotely relate to the subject matter at hand. 
While I'm at a school dance, I'll mention to my date that, you know, French monarchs love to throw lavish parties and dances. In fact, did you know that during the mid-18th century, 6% of the entire French national budget was allocated to the upkeep of the Versailles Palace and to the celebrations they held there? While watching Django Unchained with my family, I'll mention how remarkably the name Django resembles the word jingoism, which was a radically nationalistic ideology that was widely adhered to during, uh, by the authorities of the British Empire during the Anglo-Zulu War and the two Boer Wars in the late 19th century. Yes, I love history, but I'll tell you what I don't love. I don't love saying I love history. It just seems so pedestrian, like saying, I love churros, or I love Boo Too on the day of Halloween. <laughs> when someone tells you, I love history, your immediate thought to yourself is, oh wow, how can I end this conversation as quickly as possible? before this guy starts rattling off World War II statistics. <laughs> P.S. Did you know that 80% of Soviet men born in 1923 didn't survive the Second World War? Crazy. <laughs> but I'm worried that's all people think history is. That it, it's just a big fact sheet of things that happened in the distant past. That it's something to memorize for a grade. Or worst of all, that history is over. Before I continue, I want to say that it's very easy to fall prey to these common misconceptions. I mean, just look at the way students like us are exposed to history. Kids across the nation sit in, sit in the classroom while a teacher writes names, events, and dates on the chalkboard, then quizzes them about it the next day. If they're lucky, the teacher is absent and leaves a substitute with some grainy documentary from 1978 where some 85-year-old British guy drones on about, I don't know, the American yellow press in the early 20th century, while the kids try not to succumb to the soothing monotony of his silky smooth voice. <laughs> so even though I've had a plethora of great experiences in history classes through the years, shout out to Mrs. Rowan's AP European history class sophomore year, for a lot of kids, it's certainly not the most inspiring subject. What I'd like to do is reintroduce the concept and study of history, leaving things like test grades, fact sheets, and timelines behind us, and focusing on what makes this such an important and fulfilling area of the human experience. So to start, I want you all to do a bit of introspection. Just think about how infinitely complex and dynamic you are. Think about how unique your personality is how crazy your family may be, how you interact with your friends. Think about how many people you come into contact with every day, week, month, or year. Think about the times you've laughed uncontrollably or cried inconsolably. Think about the times you felt on top of the world or the times you felt crushed under its weight. I've only been alive for 18 years, some of you sixth graders and seventh graders have only been alive for just over a decade, but we can all no doubt relate to the unfathomable depth that life seems to contain. If we want to truly comprehend history, we need to realize that every person throughout the entire existence of humanity lived a life of similar complexity and immeasurable experience. From Julius Caesar to Genghis Khan, from some nameless peasant in 9th century Russia to a fur trader in 18th century French Canada. Every human life has contained unending stories of love, despair, elation, anger, relief, worry, and triumph. The connections made between people and the overlapping of their stories is the very fabric of the concept we call history. History is not a line extending in one direction, with major events dotting its path, but an ever-expanding web of intricate affiliations between everyone who has ever lived. Now, let's look at the world we live in today. 
Keith Jennings, a British historian, and a guy who would probably star in that unbearable documentary I mentioned earlier, once said, the peculiar ways in which the past was historicized has now come to an end of its productive life. The all-encompassing experiment of modernity is passing away into our postmodern condition. Ugh. The guy is basically saying that history as we knew it is pretty much over. Oh, in this era of postmodern condition is assumed to have begun somewhere in the early 90s. Now, the 90s may have been the end of many great things like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Full House, and uh, people caring about how they dressed, but it was certainly not the end of history. We are not living in a post-historical world, but one that is a continuation of the experience of those who passed it on to us. There may be a bias to believe that we're somehow special in the grand scheme of the human story, and in a lot of ways, we are. We are certainly the most technologically advanced, the most educated, the longest living, and the best at arguing with complete strangers in a YouTube comment section. <laughs> but to say, the, say that we've mastered history is a gross mischaracterization and inherently problematic. It's problematic because it strips us of our obligations to those who come after us and hardens us to the necessity or possibility of drastic change. Why save the environment if we are the end of the line? Why acknowledge our societal maladies if we're supposed to be the utopia that every civilization has been working towards? Why strive for greatness if all the great people of history have already come and gone? And I know you may be saying this to yourself, well, I don't think like this. I'm a TMI student and I'm going to change the world. But let's be honest. If you've ever seen something you knew was wrong, maybe at TMI or at home or on TV, and thought, not my problem, you're guilty of thinking like this, myself included. Instead of burying our heads in the sand, why don't we recognize our role in history and act as though we care about the legacy we leave behind? Let's head back to the story of the American Revolution. The Americans of 1775 were just like us. They were concerned about how they would put food on the table. They worried about economic hardship, the tragedies of war, and the welfare of their children. They enjoyed laughing and spending time with family and friends, and were concerned about living a secure and stable life. They had no intention of rebelling, and made attempts to resolve the conflict diplomatically. But when violence was thrust upon them by their imperial oppressors, they resolved to separate from their homeland and form their own nation based on values of individual freedom and self-governance. And I have to say, I'm pretty glad they did. These ordinary people living ordinary lives changed the course of history in ways they couldn't have imagined. They left the world in better condition than how they had entered it. They were certainly not thinking about their historical legacy or how they would be pictured almost 300 years from now. But things were not perfect, evidently. They lived in a society where kings ruled by arbitrary decree, and the average man didn't have a say in how his government burdened him. They were oppressed by a regime that ultimately didn't care about their well-being, a regime that was not for them. It may have been for selfish reasons, but the Americans of 1775 reacted to the injustice being brought on them by the English crown. They spoke up, protested, and eventually took up arms against the injustice in their society. Are we going to neglect the issues that plague our community, state, country, community, state, country, or world today just because we don't feel there is an immediate need to? Are we going to m metaphorically kick, down, kick the can down the road and let the next people deal with the mess we make? Or are we going to stand up, take responsibility as the current torchbearers of the human legacy, put an end to the injustices and inhumanities present in our world today, and make the job easier for our children, 
grandchildren, and every other person that comes after us? Are we going to be lost to history, a byword among nations? Or are we going to set the example and inspire future generations to enact positive change in whatever situation they find themselves in? But regardless of my answer, regardless of your answer, none of us can do it alone. Thank you.